So let me just get set up here a second and make sure everyone can hear me. Um, and before I share my slides, I want to say thank you for inviting me. It has been a long time since I've been to Green Valley. Um, when I was at the University of Arizona and I was funded to do a clinical trial, it was randomized and I was the treating therapist because it was a new therapy, this LSVT big, it was new. And so I'm the only one that knew how to do it that, at that moment. So I had the opportunity, I did all of the, the uh, treatment for LSVT big here in Green Valley. I um, drove down here multiple days a week and someone, uh, someone gave us a home some snowbird sort of gave us a home to stay in for several yeah, months to do excuse me, the treatment. Excuse me, the mic isn't picking you up. Oh, okay. Maybe you might have to hold it or... Um, yes, or I can try. So Zoom is okay? Are you all, can you, you want me to be louder? I can stand closer. Oh, okay. Okay. Just, is that a thumbs up on my voice? Okay, well, I want you to be able to hear me. Um, so, but I was here in Green Valley doing that research and it ended in 2004, we published it. And um, that was what changed my career actually, was I was so impressed by the amount of change that happened to people. And that was really the first physical therapy intervention that was forced use in terms of your whole body, making you work harder than you think, you, you know, do more than you think you can, use your biggest range of motion, really focus on activating those muscles. And so that, before that, you'll, as I talk, you'll see that before I did that study, the dogma out in rehab was opposite. It was like, keep it easy, keep it simple, don't challenge people because it might make their disease worse. So that's 2000 to 2005 when all this research came out and I happened to be lucky and get caught in the middle of that and realized, well, we need to do more for people. And once I saw how much change it can make, I, I decided to not go into academia, but I wanted to just really try to provide a way of doing more in, in the community and really changing how you access healthcare. We still have a lot to do on that. So, um, okay, I'm going to start. So, is it okay if I go on and share the slides? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. I don't think I have the mouse. Let's try this mouse. Oh, I got it. Sorry, I just need to, um, I, oh, I don't see my slides again. Let's see. You are? Mm -hmm. Oh, they don't show here. Let me see if I can make it. Is that all right? Okay, I can see now everything. Now let's check my, uh, yes, okay. All right, I'm gonna stand behind the podium so I can use the mic, but I tend to move, so if, if you need me to come back here, tell me. Um, I wanted to talk about exercise for brain change, because as I said, in 2000, when this animal research first came out, um, there was the idea that you could change the brain in a positive way in people with a neurodegenerative disease was like taboo. I actually gave talks in 2000 to 2010 at places and it was sort of like, oh, I don't know if, I, if she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> so it's been, it's changed tremendous. Parkinson's today is not like Parkinson's 15, 20 years ago. And so that's good news. Um, and I want to, I want to talk about the evidence. I could do that all day, but I didn't want to, um, I wanted to ask you, um, if you have specific questions, so if you shout them out to me, if there's something on research or just in general about exercise, that way I can kind of um, direct my talk to be specific. So even the folks on Zoom, if you want to chat, uh, some, is there something you really want to know about exercise or brain change so I, that I touch on it? So anybody here have a specific like thing you've thought about, like 
I don't know about dosing, how much, what's the dosing of exercise, or yes? I'd like to hear your thoughts on high intensity mm -hmm. aerobic exercise. I definitely, I got slides for that, that's perfect. Thank you. Any other specific question or topic about, it can be anything. A type of exercise or just, uh, maybe it's not exercise, maybe it's like, it makes me fatigued, what can I do? I don't feel good after, if I do too much, uh-huh. What about depression? I'm sorry. Exercise. Oh, yes. The relationship and if it can help and all. Okay. Yes. Good one. How about uh, the difference or the similarity between doing physical exercise and cognitive exercise? Wonderful. That is going to, I will. And, it, and again, at any point in my talk, you're welcome to just get your hand up there. Tell me you want more information. One, one thing, did you address the uh, per people that are just too tired to get started, how to get them into exercise. Yes. Get out of your chair and actually begin to do something. Mm-hmm. And I'm making notes so I don't. Okay, good. Yes, ma'am. Does exercise help with aphasia? Uh, wow. That's a good question. I, I know a, a therapist that specializes in aphasia and we've been wanting to do a class with her clients to see if that helps. So yes, I will, I might address that right now. So aphasia uh, is usually associated with a stroke where, but just it's a pro problem trying to get the word out. Yes, but it's not always, I don't mean to contradict. That's okay, You're, it's not always. So. Um, does movement and physical exercise stimulate sort of language and the ability to produce and communicate? Um, you know, there is not a study on that directly, but it certain, exercise certainly improves cognition. And so if you could work on including vocalization into your exercise using uh, simple words or maybe sentences and phrases, you could integrate it into movement. And it might be more meaningful to the person if you practiced it with movement. Because, you know, just like children, we don't really talk without moving, especially me. But, you know, we go around life, usually we talk when we're with someone and you're doing something. So it might be helpful. But no. Okay. So let me click here. I think I need to do the keyboard. So, um, I, I founded Parkinson Wellness Recovery because I wanted to be able to do, this sounds, um, healthcare back in 2010 when I founded this was not what it should be. And I didn't want to try to get into a system and not be able to change it. So I thought, I'll just open my own gym and do what I want. And, <laughs> and that's what we did. And now everybody wants to do that. And now science is seeing this kind of paradigm that we're doing at the power gym is really uh, important that we make changes in our healthcare system. So um, I founded it, and even before 2010, I left the university. I was sort of slowly transitioning out of research that we were doing, and I started working at a, a public gym, a Mid Valley Athletic Club in town, one of the first gyms in Tucson, and they allowed me to have space. And I worked with the fitness instructors there that were interested in Parkinson's and we just started group classes and I started consulting and we just started shaping and teaching each other and, and uh, basically the, we put together these, uh, this idea of Parkinson's specific skill training and what is that and how do we teach it to people and um, include it in fitness and in rehab. So I started at, um, kind of volunteering until uh, we had so many people we ran, we were really out of space and I realized that it's not a lot of money making, it's hard to make money in group exercise just because of the cost of the space. Um, and so that's why we did a nonprofit because it allowed us to sort of accept donations and grow that and have that to help us get started and as sort of extra to help us grow. So that's, um, it's been great. We have learned how to, it is feasible to have a center where you offer rehab and exercise that can mm, break even, make money in different areas, but it's still not super profitable um, because we need to get healthcare 
to recognize that exercise in Parkinson's is um, clinical exercise. It is not just go, go find a fitness person. You need a special fitness person. And, and when you exercise, it should be Parkinson's specific because you, know, you wanna get the most out of it for your time to address the disease and the symptoms and the problems that it causes. So um, that's considered clinical exercise, just like if you have a heart attack and you get to go to cardio rehab and they pay for that, right? Why can't they do that for Parkinson's? When you're diagnosed, you get so much subsidies for your exercise in the community. So that's our vision, is to show it's feasible. We have a budget now. We can show that people don't stop coming. That's one of the first questions people ask. Well, if you provide ongoing access to exercise, people will not keep coming. The problem is they don't go away. <laughs> then you need more space and more instructors and more costs. So it's actually opposite. So we're trying to publish that kind of data from our gym. It's retrospective, real world data. It's not a, a clinical trial, but it's important for feasibility and to show and to try to get that out. So, um, so that's how I got started. And I really just wanted people to have access to what I call as exercise as medicine. Like, all this new research in animals and now humans. It's great to read it, but how do you do it? How do you apply it to therapies, both physical occupational therapy and exercise therapies? Because it is a therapy. They need to consider exercise in that realm. So, um, so we just wanted people to have more access. And so we started it gym where we could do it. We started a workshops that are now international where we train people in the concepts, all this research and how to apply it. Um, therapists and uh, fitness instructors. And the whole idea is if you have access to the right kind of exercise for life, that's the most hope there is right now for slowing disease progression. And a physician will tell you that too. It's not enough to just go for a bout of therapy once in your life or just one class. So, you know, and you know, maybe two or three days a week, you want to do more and you want to feel better and do more in your everyday life. So it's a hard prescription, right? For you, you've got to do something really every day. It doesn't have to be a full class, but you need to think about moving more in your everyday life and doing more of what you like and feeling like you can do it. Um, and so it's like trying to take the animal studies and how can we get people to do that? <laughs> because the animal studies were amazing and they really show that you can slow disease progression and have an impact on the disease mechanisms. Not, you know, we know you feel better after you exercise physically and cognitively, emotionally, but to, but to think that you might affect the brain and the disease mechanisms, that's another like aha, great thing. And in animals it happens and now there's some, slowly the data in humans is developing and I will at the end talk about some of my favorite sort of studies in that section. Um, so um, I feel like I just skipped, let me go back, a bunch of buttons just went. Yes, we lost, a, I don't know, I hit several buttons there, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. So let me just show you a few videos because the idea is what was my motivation? My motivation was the research. Um, because the animal studies showed it can, it can improve brain health. The healthier the brain, the more it can resist neurodegenerative diseases and put off disease. It can affect brain repair in dopamine circuits in animals. And now that we have that data in humans, we have changes in the dopamine system better if more efficient dopamine circuitry. That's awesome. And, and it's so that they're trying to show the same things in people. And we know that even if the dopamine circuits are damaged, the brain can adapt and figure out other pathways and help you move better. So it doesn't, anywhere in the disease, they're gonna benefit from exercise. But the earlier you start, the more you'll benefit from the brain health and repair mechanisms. So. Um, that was my motivation. And then there was people like, uh, this is our current class. I'm just going to play it. Um, we got new space through COVID. I have to say 
thanks to COVID for that one thing. And um, we were able to pick up space that a fitness club could no longer be manage the lease. So we got a good deal to get started. Um, so they're doing mindful movement right here. They're, um, and this is show you some of what it looks like. We have so much more space, it's incredible. And so we can have two classes going on and rehab, and that's where you start to break even and make money, is because you wanna be able to have more than one class a day. You can't make money or survive in that as a business. So this kind of space has really allowed us to create a budget that's um, doable. So we, and you know, we do, um, all of our classes have aerobics and then skill training, and uh, we'll talk about that is really based on the research. Um, we use a lot of targets for best quality practice, a little bit of strength training there, get anger management there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like hitting that boxing bag, right? Throw that sand bell on the ground. We have lights and things, it's that are fun to use for, a, it adds a little cognitive activity, visual spatial things where you have to quickly get to the right lights at the right time. Um, and this is a lady who had younger onset freezing of gait with freezing of, I'm sorry, she's stopped. She's trying to, we're doing a set, an assessment, and we're trying to measure how long it takes her to do it, and she's freezing. And so we did an intensive two weeks every day with her, and I just, you know, this, this, this is the kind of change that can happen when people practice at the right dosing, with the right skill training. So she's doing the very same task and can walk through the door and everything and doesn't hardly hesitate. She's still trying to get going around that square on the floor right now. So her life is 100% different to be able to be that the fear, the anxiety, that symptom of freezing of day, to have control over it. Now, she's not going to stay. She continued, and it also helped her get back into the group exercise classes because she was freezing so bad, you know, she had to stop the exercise, which then that makes things worse. So she continues to come in for rehab every three months for four days in a row as a tune-up, and she's never gotten this bad again, and it's on her, like, third year. So she still has freezing of gait, but she has this ability to stay on top of it over and over again with intensive one-on-one, -on -one, and then she can do her group classes and benefit from all that. So it is um, a very complex symptom. Not everyone has freezing of gait, but when you have it, it's a, you know, it, one time a week, you really gotta tackle it over and over again, because it's like a bad habit. So um, that's my motivation. And this is my, another person who had advanced Parkinson's over 25 years was in a wheelchair and his, uh, he went to rehab and they told him that um, they couldn't do anything for him. He had reached a plateau and you know discharged him. And he came to see us and he said, this is like my last hope. I, I want to get better. I want to at least be able to help people m help me move. I want to have to contribute to you know, my care. So we worked with him almost nine months and uh, the, I'll show you a little bit after this, but the goal was, can he, um, he want, at his six month assessment with us, we were seeing him three and four times a week for rehab. Um, we were like, well, what's your goals? What can we work on? And he pointed to our group exercise class and said, I wanna be in that class. And so we said, okay, to be in the class, you have to be able to get up and down from the floor with a chair um, on your own, you know, without being lifted. And that was his goal, and this is the first day he accomplished it on the left, and this is um, nine months later, he's continued to come to group class and get a kind of a combination of rehab and group exercise. And let's see. Hold, hold on to your chair. Yes. 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 
are really a major for him. So now he comes to group class and he is continuing to get better because we walk on the treadmill 20 or 30 minutes in that class plus the, the practice we get in the skill. And he has a walker and now he's more mobile. And guess what the biggest barrier is for him now at his skilled nursing facility where he lives? Don't, he can't move. They're scared to death for him to move. So they don't want him to move. <laughs> Right? So many barriers. So, okay. And um, I'll skip some of the treatment videos, but he definitely took a lot of ex We did a lot of things with him over time. So, and he continues to come today and he does um, bouts of rehab and then he has all his classes and it's the, you know, it's, he's not gotten worse. He's managed, his endurance has improved. So he may not have a lot of dopamine left in his brain after 25 years, but he's, his brain is adapting and he's, lots, he's a lot more functional. So he can still make improvements and change his quality of life. Um, so this is just a timeline which I've really mentioned now that, you know, in two, starting in 2000 with the dogma was keep it simple. In 2006, uh, all this, uh, I'm sorry, in 2000, all the animal research started to be published. It continues today. They're starting to look at different, you know, they look at disease severity, so in different animal models, and they've shown um, also tr looking at different types of exercise now in the animals. You can get animals to do coordination and, and hand dexterity by they pull on spaghetti. I don't know, there's all kind of fun games that they can do to look at improvements. But the animal research was so compelling, it's really undeniable because it's replicated now and no other neurodegenerative disease has this amount of research in animals. So there's just no excuse that people aren't referred to immediately at diagnosis. The problem is they don't know where to send people because they need people that are Parkinson's specialized. You need to have people that understand the disease and the kind of movements that you need. Um, and how to, how to do that in a group class or personal training or, th or rehab. Um, so, you, and we, people need to start early and the animals showed that there's a maintenance threshold. Just like that guy, the guy I showed you and the, actually both of those videos, we can't just discharge people with freezing of gait or more advanced Parkinson's. You have to keep tuning people up and, and they need to keep moving in between bouts of one-on-one. -on -one. They need continuous practice. There's a threshold for how much, I'm not sure if it, that's really known, um, but it seems to be that three times a week is sort of a beginning point in most of the research out there. You've got to do something um, or you're just going to get worse again, right? Just like all of us would. I mean, if I don't exercise and do the things that um, I immediately know it a few week, weeks later, I might try to lift a weight or something or climb a hill. Um, it needs, the animals showed us it needs to be forced use. Those animals were working harder than they wanted by running on a treadmill, by daily practice, um, and you know, they were forcing them to move their whole body with, with treadmill especially, uh, upper and lower limbs. Um, and then there's research that, and it's hard to tease apart aerobics and skill training, because almost any aerobics you do, you're also, teaching the brain a skill. You walk on a treadmill, you're doing gait training. You ride a bicycle, you're teaching your legs better interlimb coordination. You're tr learning how to pedal faster and smoother and efficient. And that translates to, believe it or not, better hand upper body coordination and timing in the arms by working on the legs. It's pretty interesting. That tells you the brain is changing. It's not because it's generalizing across different parts of the brain. Um, and then the human research has sort of grown in parallel. So they try to, to, sh to you know, at first, um, they did show that probably the strongest data in humans is aerobics, absolutely. 
got to do it um, because it's, um, it's magic for brain health. It also helps you learn. So if you're going to work on something like a skill, like getting up from the floor or, or moving your body in a coordinated way, it's probably good that you go do a little aerobics for 10 minutes and get your brain um, primed before you start just something skillful that's hard. And so people get better. We call that priming. And so that's why we like to do aerobics before a class. Um, and you, if it's at least a 10 minute bout, it's been shown in research to improve attention. So the attentional centers of the brain light up, working memory is better. So that's because of the, because the brain kind of gets primed like that, then you just do better in your skillful practice. Um, uh, so this kind of paradigm, this requires a paradigm shift. If we want to implement the concepts and translate this research into the real world, our current outpatient and patient facilities, you know, it's just not going to work. No one wants to go to an outpatient facility when you're diagnosed with Parkinson's, right? I mean, it's like, you don't, I'm not sick. I don't want to go to outpatient. So having things in the community is one empowering way to get people to start immediately and not be in denial and put it off. It's like, yeah, there's a community center down the road where they specialize in Parkinson's and they have specialists in healthcare, like rehab specialists there too. So you can access all, so who have healthcare to connections and then you have exercise professionals who have all this expertise in group and personal training and community wellness. So, um, and so we wanted, that really points to the need for this. And um, more and more outpatient facilities are starting to offer group, you know, but you have to go to a building somewhere in a healthcare system. A lot of therapists that we've trained and fitness people are opening their own clinics and offering maybe rehab with extra space for group. So that's, that's all helping. Um, and then we even have people that are trying to replicate this model we have of a community center where you do everything with rehab and um, I wish we could even offer social work and other health, you know, a mental health, other kinds of services in the future, but, um, you know, they're community centers. So we have other colleagues doing that. Uh, in diff it's always, it looks different in every location around the world, um, but things are changing. Uh, but to get it to be adopted by Medicare, they got to see the numbers and they want to see an eff effectiveness study. Like they, we don't need to do um, a randomized clinical trial now as much as an effectiveness study. If you translate this and do it in the real world like we're doing in the gym and show over time that people continue to stay better and don't drop out, that's the kind of data Medicare would love. And then the cost. And when you show them the cost of keeping people better versus the cost of putting them in healthcare services where it's so expensive, um, it's really, that's, that's the kind of numbers they want to see. So if any of you are you know, real into that kind of research, come talk to me. <laughs> We've got, um, we're going to publish some papers this year. So um, when you talk about positive brain change, I like to sort of uh, put it on a timeline like this at the bottom. Because there's over the course of years, the dopamine system, if it continues to degenerate, um, that line, that slanted line, represents the percentage of dopamine neurons left in the brain, sort of. It gives you, a, it's just a way to visualize it. And you can see that it's not until there's about a 50% loss of dopamine in the brain that people are, they start to have motor signs and symptoms, and, and they still may not go to the doctor right away. So that's what that little dopamine level threshold is, where it crosses that line and the first symptoms appear. Um, and so the whole goal in medicine right now is to try to diagnose people in that window of time before you have motor symptoms. It's called the prodromal period. So that means we could put it off. If we could start with the appropriate exercise, you could slow the onset of the disease. That would be like a, you know, a miracle, even if it's just a few years or five or 10 years. That's probably 
really hopeful because they are developing biomarkers. We've actually had people been in those studies come to the gym and they said, I think I have PD, what should I do? I may have PD, they put me in this study and they say I have some signs and markers. So that will be the future as well. And another reason why a community site is really relevant, again, for people that are living their life and you know they just, uh, they don't know what's going on, they can come and find out what kind of exercise to start. Um, but, and as, you know, when people start to enter exercise later in the disease after they have a diagnosis, um, it doesn't mean that you still can't protect the remaining dopamine neurons. That would be neuroprotection. You know, that would be the gold, the, the amazing thing to find. But it, it doesn't, but you can also repair the damaged circuits. And most of the studies in humans are in that point where it says diagnosis. And you see that you know, the, some of the cells are dying. So that you have an option. It, you might, brain health might help protect the brain but we needed to use exercises to help drive those damaged circuits, those dopamine circuits, to help repair them, force them to be active, force them to be used. Um, so that is sort of a window to think about uh, exercise and all the research on exercise in animals and humans. But um, the good thing is we know in animals you can protect the dopamine neurons and they get better and stay better as long as they stay some activity threshold. We know animals can, that you can repair the damaged circuits and they start making more dopamine or it, they don't get worse, the dopamine is more efficient, they make, they, they do more with the dopamine they have. Their system is just more efficient, more, more neurotransmitters, um, less stress uh, in the area. The circuits are um, doing their, just working better under less stress. So that's just a vision of thinking about the research. And this slide is supposed to be interactive and it, 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 could, it won't do it in this format, so I'll just explain it. When people talk about disease-modifying therapies, um, they're talking about can you affect the mechanisms that are causing the cells to die? Can you interfere with that mechanism so the cell doesn't get told to die? because there's a signal that goes to that cell. So these are different mechanisms that they, they believe are triggering cell death or involved in the pathways of cell death. So they're looking for drugs and supplements or you know all kinds of things, vaccines, are trying to find things that will affect these mechanisms in basic science. But guess what? Exercise affects every one of these mechanisms and it's been demonstrated in animals and several of them in humans, so I'll just explain. One mechanism is the loss of neurotrophic factors. Um, specific ones, these are those Gatorades in the brain that the dopamine neurons need to survive. So if you don't have enough of them, that's one thing that causes the cells to get sick. Exercise upregulates neurotrophic factors, including the ones specific to dopamine neurons. It's been shown in rehab, intensive rehab, and it's been shown with intensive exercise. Um, the mitochondria in the body, they, this is where you produce all your energy. But, and the cells need a lot of energy because they're producing proteins like every 24 hours. So if there's anything wrong with your mitochondria, the cells kind of have an energy failure. They, get, they struggle, right? And eventually they just can't keep it going. Well, exercise directly impacts your mitochondria, both in the brain and in the periphery and the muscles. Um, there are also other drugs and things that are out there that may also they're looking at that might do these same kinds of things, right? But I'm here to tell you, don't, this is why you should exercise, because we know already these things are infected. Oxidative damage and stress, that's sort of the environment where the neurons are living. The more stressed and more of these negative in, uh, chemicals, enzymes that are in the area, the more those cells are um, suffering. If you can clean up the environment, some climate control there, you can um, improve the functioning of the cells. They're happier, thrive, they live a little longer, and exercise affects that, and so does um, sleep and meditation. 
which shows shown to decrease the stress factors just from blood draws, but still it tells you that your nervous system is probably less stressed. Um, and then the final one is this whole thing about alpha synuclein, so that the idea that there is sort of a, a crazy protein out there that is changing its shape and becoming toxic, and it's killing neurons, and it's spreading from dopamine neuron to dopamine neuron, and it kills them. So it's a protein uh, aggregation problem. Like a lot of neurodegenerative diseases are, are associated with some kind of protein deficiency. It so happens alpha-synuclein seems to be the one in Parkinson. So there were medicines, at the time of this sort of discovery, and it was all due to Michael J. Fox, who has targeted this from the beginning, like focused point. Now, he wanted to know what alpha-synuclein does and what's going on. And, um, they started looking at existing medications and vaccines. What if your body could fight the protein if you had a vaccine? What if there was a medicine for cancer that already worked on these, uh, helped the, the cells be better garbage disposals and get rid of the proteins? And there are meds like that that are being tested. But they've shown in animals that exercise can get rid of this bad toxic protein in the brain and, and periphery and it flushes it out of the system into the blood. So that's interesting, right? So there's no evidence yet for that in humans, but um, I'm pretty sure that will be something they look at as they develop these long-term exercise studies. So there are certain essentials. What you do is important, aerobics and skill training, and the thing is, if you have Parkinson's, you probably want to do different types of skill training than maybe someone with a different kind of disease, right? So the, you really want to do Parkinson-specific skill training, and um, that's why we develop the power moves. So I'm going to have you just stand for five minutes and do, and I'll talk about it as I do it, and I will, um, I'm going to stand in the middle with a different microphone so the Zoom people can sort of see. So you can stand, it's, you don't want to do a lot, I just want you to feel why these skills are so important for Parkinson's. Um, so let me grab the microphone. And then I'll quickly throw in some research. So the main
lose the control, the automatic control of your extensors, all of us start to flex. Our shoulders come forward, our weight's on the toes a little bit, your knees might, and all of us are in this position. And it is hard, and also because of the stiff hips, the base of support shifts. And that puts you in a really difficult position. Like it's hard to step big if you're here, because your big step is going to be more like this. Because that you're in a you're not in a good position of a alignment to get started. So we work a whole lot on ex, uh, just extension in every position. And it can turn into a workout if you're in um, if you're in an exercise program and or it can turn into a functional activity like reaching into a shelf, right? Getting something and being able to hold on to it and stay powered up. So um, try this, bring your feet under your hips. So wider than you think, already you should feel a difference. And um, I want you to think about <laughs> a hinge right here. And you know, I'm not gonna scram I'm going to try to let my nose go out, my hips back, right? And then, and then yeah, so I'm trying to squat like there's a chair behind me. I'm trying to keep my weight more on my, toe, my heels than my toes. Then I'm in the position to power up straight and tall. Activating like my head's back, my heels are back, everything. So the control of your extensors You can't box well if you can't stand up high. <laughs> you cannot hit, you don't have your best hit if you're not here and ready and put your whole body into it. So I never got to box with you, but that's what I would tell you. Um, so um, we call it power, but all of this is extension. And then the other one is weight shift. So put, put your feet how you normally put them. Kind of think about that. And think about how far you can go in any direction. A little narrower, even forward and backwards. You don't have much limit of stability. You're like right in the middle. Now put them wider and stay powered up and think about how much further I might even be able to shift my weight so my toe comes up and I don't have to keep it so flat because I, I can go further. If you can't weight shift, you're going to freeze and hesitate. Your body is going to be like, oh, I don't know which leg to move, right? If you can't weight shift, you can't balance. The whole magic of balance is being, and you can't get going. We're doing it to stand. Oh my God. We're using this step. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> when you have to unweight, and when you're on your stomach or on bed and you want to roll, it's the same thing. You have to weight shift to get yourself over, right? So the same skills we practice in standing, you, you need to do them in every position, right? Because that's, that's just how we move in life. If you're in a chair, we weight shift a lot forward and backward, and we don't not so much to get out of the chair. So weight shifting, the other one is axial mobility. So this is a, um, it's kind of like the core work uh, that, you know, it's not just, um, you need to be able to stay in good alignment with this wide base of support. And then you can start looking over your head and rotating and letting your head and hips all be involved in the movement. This takes balance and you can't really do it very well if you're really flexed. You, you want to be able to get, so we provide a lot of uh, assistance and things. But axial mobility <coughs> is the key to moving efficiently. It, so if you try Moving, um, all these spouses out there, if you try to move without axial mobility, you're going to quickly be like exhausted. Because, you know, you're moving and nothing else is moving. And if you, everything you do, think how much struggle it is if I can't rotate. To get down on the floor, it's just like so effortful because I can't do it efficiently. I can't use all this mobility and, and the spine. Routine, the head and the hips. So, and then the last one is actually.
to making transitional movements. So in standing, it's the idea of changing your position in space. So um, from a powered up position, I would have to weight shift. To this, if I decide to turn, I have to point my foot in the direction I want to go, and then I'm ready to go. And so we work on transitions and then adding and building to all of that. So we may start with just some skills, one at a time, but then we create sequences and then we turn them into like more functional things or more sports things. If you like the golf, there's a whole sequence there, right? You've got to power up your posture. You've got to be able to have a lot of axial mobility. And so we could create sequences that are meaningful and then you build that into your life and those kinds of activities. So, so those are the skills. I just wanted to slightly fill them for a little bit. There, it's not magic, and the thing is that they're really good for anyone. But in Parkinson's, it's critical that you, you understand those skills, you practice them ongoing, because those are going to get worse. So everything you do, not just, uh, not just dressing, but if you like to box, you could better do your power moves and keep it, that awareness of your alignment and weight shifting so that you box with good quality, right? Because I'm going to look at someone boxing and see if they're in, are they in a, are they having quality box or are they here and they're not really getting anything out of it? So when you dance, it's the same way. Rather than dance with poor quality, if you practice these skills, you're going to be aware of how to dance with better control, and then you'll keep practicing the skills, so that you can integrate them into anything. Pickleball, I don't know what you like to do. Um, just walking with poles or walking, yeah, do you have a question? Oh, okay, I thought you were raising your hand. Okay, but well, let's talk about some research then real quick, and I'll try to answer a few of these questions. And cognition. So I'm going to turn this mic off and go back over to my little corner over here. Okay, so it seems so simple, but you can very quickly take an activity like power up. So what's hard about that? So I could add weights. I could change the surface you're standing on. Or I could say, now we're going to power up high, mid, low, or we're going to rock high. So you could start adding directional changes, more real world things. I could make it more unpredictable. Um, every time I, s um, I think I have a chart here, but I could just start adding games. So if I say up, don't do it. Like a go, no go. So we can start training cognition during the movement. And actually, that is when the magic starts to happen with the brain. It's not enough to just physically uh, lift a weight, let's say, um, or to put in high effort by itself, because over time you're going to get bored. If I have you do that, which was the problem with LSVT Big, which is why I did not keep working in LSVT Big, it's repetitious, but they don't add these cognit cognitive attentional progressions. You have to keep the exercise interesting and keep the brain engaged. And it's one reason that virtual games that they're trying to create for Parkinson's are great because it, it keeps your mind just So we have to create that in rehab. It's got it, exercise classes have to have this kind of cognitive challenge. Um, and so we start with effort. We get good quality. Good. It looks good. And then we add high attentional focus. What are, you know, people are like this. I'm like, what is your hand doing? Where are your eyes? Look at your hand. Look at, make your hand as big as possible. What's your leg doing? Can you kick it? So you have to train attentional focus first. And then you can start adding all these other cognitive challenges, complexity, novelty, unpredictability, changing the surfaces and the timing, fast and slow. and. Um, I can do things where you don't know if I'm going to do it and it's unpredictable. That is what makes exercise work. By itself, you might get stronger, but your brain is not going to make changes. So 
That is why, I mean, when you, if you, I'm not going to say that, um, they've also shown that non-exercise um, activity, physical activity, also decreases symptoms. One of the reasons is when you think about what you do in your everyday life, just other physical activity, like gardening, cleaning, going to the store, walking the dog, that counts because actually that's pretty complex activity for the brain. Even though it's not exercise, it's important activity that, you, that still counts on your daily, you know, your list of what did I do today? Because a lot of everyday activity does have a lot of cognitive elements in it. So, you know, so that's why doing those things you like is important. It keeps you engaged, visual, spatial, problem solving, planning, those are important things. So, uh, and then there's this emotional engagement thing. That's why rehab is really great one-on-one. -on -one. You can make benefits. Um, but it's hard to have this group connection, this social connection. You might have a good connection with your therapist, but people with Parkinson's have this real need, the brain needs this social connection, this emotional engagement. Um, and anxiety and depression interfere so much with people participating in outside activities. But when they do, their symptoms get better. So they've shown aerobics specifically does help depression and mood and all of us. Um, anxiety, that lady you saw with the freezing of gait, high anxiety, triggering her freezing of gait. She had to learn to meditate and do meditative walking and slow movement and mindful and breathing. And as she learned how to do that, she, you know, she learned how to control some of that that triggers her that's why she could control her freezing of gait. She learned how to control that symptom of anxiety. So, but depression, if you, you know, once people get into a group and they start acting, exercising, usually they don't have, report so much depression. And it's either the aerobic components, which can happen like many ways, or it's also the social connection that helps them feel like themselves again, right? Everybody needs that. And it lets them have real, you know, talk, sit and talk with people about how they feel about things. So, uh, so that's the magic ingredients in anything you do. It needs to be effortful, high attentional focus, fun, complex, mixed up in prop, you know, things happening, a crazy environment. Sometimes the more crazy the environment, the more you're using your cognition. And you need to have time to have this connection to your peers. So, um, and what we do, and all we do, is we just have this foundation of skills that we're always integrating into any activity and trying to look at the quality of practice, keeping it good quality. And that way people are safer, they can um, stay in the classes and really participate better, so um, that is how the power moves fit into the exercise. And of course we try to make uh, as a rehab therapist, I try to make your everyday movements exercise because you can, you know, you could, the way you move around your house can count as exercise. So, um, and get you to do more. So, okay. Um, I just can't skip this slide. Uh, you know, despite all the exercise that we talk about, Actually, if you have any of these red negative factors, these barriers, they can, re they can actually make the benefits of exercise go away. They interfere with the benefits of exercise. So it's important that you address sleep and nutrition and stress because that can help you get more out of your exercise and rehab. And that has been shown in animals, direct evidence for it. And in, I, I would say I've seen it in so many clients who, just like the lady with freezing of gait, she has so much more potential, but her anxiety was whew, off the charts. And then she couldn't benefit from her ex therapy. So we have, to ha we have to address the wellness side of people. That's another thing that's critical for Parkinson's. It's like essential. 
And um, we have to, those are mostly in the community. There are some healthcare resources for that. We need more mental health and more women's support groups. Because yes, uh, so much research. Uh, could anyone here run that women's support group? Because I would send you an article. So they just published, uh, it's a speaker for our retreat, and she just published an article, Women in PD, and it's just a summary of all the complexities and differences and uh, the future research needed. It's, and uh, it's pretty amazing. So, all right, I'm gonna go to the research here and just skip these slides. Um, sorry, we did that. You'll have a hand, I see some of the things um, that I hope it's over to be able to send to the Zoom people and all of you. Um, I have a few over there. This is one that um, I didn't have a ton of copies of. So if for any reason you want to have more information about power moves or you just want to practice them, we have brand new videos. I'm going to show you where. Um, oops. Okay, right here. Under This is our website, powerfullife.org. And under Watch the Power Moves, there's this resource menu up here at the top. If you come down where that arrow is, sorry, this keyboard is magic. It's doing something. Um, there's videos that you can watch that are really great. Jennifer talks about an intro, and then she'll teach you how to do them, like fundamentals. And you can practice them and do them all in different positions. Uh, and she's really... we. It's a good place to go for sort of an introduction. And they're free on the internet. So, okay, I think I'm over. So I might have to stop. <laughs> um, I can just tell you that uh, I have research in the slides. There is a PDF. Um, and the question on research, well, we covered the cognition and depra depression. High intensity, it is necessary but it's different for every person, just so you know that. That's why it would be good to get an, an established prescription for your aerobic level from a therapist who could watch you and come and come up with an interval workout for you um, or, or figure out what activity would be best to do. Um, but, oh, you do want to progress the challenge. So over time, you should get more endurance and be able to do, you know, higher heart rates for longer periods of time. But high intensity heart rates, your heart rate when you're high intensity may be different than yours, right? But you still, you both still feel high intensity and you're breathing hard, um, but your percentage of your effort is matched, but your heart rates aren't going to be the same. So that's why it helps to get, have someone sit down with you and take you through a, a, a workout and help you determine what those levels are for you. But um, it's, Mo even moderate intensity in the slides I had shows benefits. It just may mean you have to do moderate for six months, when if you do high intensity, you might feel the benefits in three months, right? But you still, it might, both, both of them are probably important. Okay, I'm gonna close, thank That's you. Yes. Uh -huh. My question is this, intellectually, I know that I need You need a coach. You need to come to a therapist for a coach. It can be a personal trainer, but what happens in Parkinson's is one of those red arrow negative factors. When you're injured, even if it's just a car injury or, or you're sick and you lose your endurance or whatever, you have a your symptoms get worse right away. Most people just continue. Let's say you were here and your symptoms or you get injured are here. If you don't go and get a tune-up and get a intensive workout program going, you're gonna stay here and then get worse, right? So, but we know you can get back to that baseline. So I always tell people the second you, it can be a mild injury or you just had a flu or something happened, a surgery. 
that is the time to go see a therapist one-on-one -on -one because they can work with you and get you confident and, and get your, your symptoms, you know, help you get back to baseline, and then you can go back to what you're doing and you'll feel like it. Because you do need more help at that point in your life. And, and take advantage of it. Insurance can cover it. You, it will make a big difference in your, the next three months. It'll make a big difference. Yeah. Where, where, where do we find a coach or a counselor like that? Yes. So after, when we train the therapist, OTPT, we teach them to be their Parkinson specialized. They know this stuff. They know how to motivate you. They know to help you be successful and set goals. But also, we're training fitness professionals to also understand goal setting and positive psychology and self-efficacy, all these things that you need as a coach. So um, look for Parkinson's specialized um, uh, people. And we do have a directory on our website. And I will tell you, I can announce it today, John, because I just told John. We, um, as an organization, the Parkinson's Foundation has accredited our training programs for um, exercise professionals. That's a really big deal. It's like a stamp of gold. Um, they're working, they work to develop guidelines and competencies we apply. We got their highest reference. That means that we're training people that can be Parkinson specialized and, have, and they, they are meeting all the competencies, which is they understand that you need a coaching goal setting and they understand that if you're in my group class and you get injured, I'm going to send you back to the therapist for maybe a month right or make sure you see someone and there's a back bi-directional referral because you need to access all of those things do you go outside of arizona i guess we have on our directory in every state canada and now some people in Faroe island our first person wherever that is <laughs> Website. Yes, it's PWR and then the number four life.org. And um, it's what, yes, and you'll under resources it says find um, a power professional, find a PWR professional, and it will bring you to the directory. Can I say one more time? Uh, right? Yeah, it's, it's not caps either, it's just PWR and the number four. Like, yeah, and then life. life. Yeah, power for life, pwr for life dot org. Um, yeah, and yes. I just wonder, how do you, we, we, we brought, when we moved here six months ago, a ferrocycle. Mm -hmm. Do you use that? What is your feeling on it, on the ferrocycle? Um, I think it depends upon why a stationary bike might not work for you. Like, is it... I don't think it's magical. I think it's a good that you, it can help you raise your heart. It might give you because you can set the speeds. You get some feedback, which is nice. But you know, there are studies on on um, bikes in general. Pedaling for Parkinson's is actually a nonprofit now. Um, there are studies in Sweden that just did indoor bicycles. So I think it has. It does give a little more help, assistance to go at a higher rate, but if you have a good coach who is developing, like setting intervals for you, like you're gonna start at 40 R, uh, RPM and you're gonna go to 50 for three minutes, you know, so that you're constantly trying to go faster and pedal faster on the bike, that's what makes the bike work. You're not just slow pedaling, you're trying to do faster and then when you get tired, back off another fast, right? Um, so, yeah. Yes. Are there any other questions? Just, I think we have one in the front. Oh. oh. As far as getting out to the coach, of course, you can know <laughs> for a coach. It makes it so much easier to get out to the Yep. Whoever so thought of that should be a millionaire. Nose, nose over toes. toes. It does. <laughs> yep. Just always think about your nose when you're doing stuff. Where is it? <laughs> Um, I did have a slide at the end, but we, um, so our, we have, we have a gym, we do workshops, that is our, actually money making, that is our main way of we actually support our growth of the gym, is our workshops, but also we have a retreat every year, which we couldn't do for two years, and it's open today, um, and we have a retreat, uh, which is just, it's a week-long thing, and you can go to our website, and it's open, if anyone's interested.
Yes, in the back. Is there a, a pro in doing that way? You know, I wanted to talk to you all about this because I wish we had put the gym here in some ways. Um, we've, for years, we've wanted to have a satellite or something here. We do have a couple of therapists, but I think they work for different uh, sort of assisted or different facilities around town. I will, when I get back, I'll look up to see if I can find specific people. Um, but we have tried to come up with a way of where they, some people who are, if you know anyone that's already working in fitness facilities who wants to get specialized, you can tell them about us because now that we're accredited as well, we're like, uh, you know, we have a continuing ed course, a certification for them. Um, and it, all it means is they're going to understand Parkinson's better. They're going to understand your movements and these power moves, and they can incorporate them into anything, you know, boxing, dance, whatever kind of exercise they do. Um, they'll just do it better. They'll do it more Parkinson's specialized. But I, that's a question I've been bothering me for years. Why did I not stay in Green Valley? <laughs>
most of you know, our motto is give Parkinson's the sack, and it reminded me of one of the slides. <laughs> SAC stands for mentally stimulated, physically active, and socially connected. Oh, perfect. So, I <laughs> love that acronym. So I'm giving you a sack. Thank you. <laughs> I will take it. And there is a piece of jewelry inside that was made by Val back there. Thank you. And um, she's donating jewelry that oh, if you buy on Etsy, she will donate that money to our room. Awesome, that is what I have on today, Val. 